Smurf, first base, what you got? All right, first base. So real quick on this, I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to go underrated first. And before I do that, I'm just going to say that um, with all these underrated, overrated, uh, we're talking about, you know, who our picks are, but we're never asking the question, why are these guys overrated? Why are they underrated? Why are we able to look at statistics and realize that their ADP isn't matching up to it? And the clear answer is something that I know that Matt and I are both guilty of. It comes right down to baseball face. That's exactly why. Well, it's not exactly why, but it's part of the reason why people are overrated underway. Baseball face. We both hate uh, Gavin Lux because as soon as we saw his face, we realized that he looked like a bully and that we didn't want him. And that's played out. That's played out pretty much. And uh, so anyway, with, with underrated, everyone loved him. Uh, a year ago, and he did okay last year. Andrew Vaughn is a great player, and he has not tapped his potential yet. I saw his ADP at 222 when I checked today on this, and the only reason why he's underrated is you just need to look at his player profile and look at his face. His eyes are way too close together. Yeah. People see that, and they don't trust it. They just don't trust the guy, and so despite his pedigree, despite his performance, they don't want him. He's way underrated. And that brings me to the overrated for first baseman is that I got two on this. One is my own that I, that I traded for uh, Paul Goldschmidt, great baseball face, but old as hell and had a terrible season. Everyone looks at his face and they go, you know what? How could a face like that not come back this year? And then of course, with, uh, with Cody Bellinger, the dude looks like he could be like on the cast of Euphoria and they go like, oh my God, that guy is awesome. I want him as soon as I can get him, maybe the fourth or fifth round, but it's not going to happen because the dude just like did well in the summer in Chicago and the ball flew out, uh, but he's not going to hit, you know, 30 home runs again, but he's got that face, man. He's got those eyes. So, you know, anyway. Yeah, my 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 favorite first baseman. Uh, even though I am susceptible to baseball face, I'm not beyond it. I I I'm, I fall prey to baseball face. But uh, but my favorite first baseman um, right now is uh, Rowdy Rowdy Telez, and he's going to be the starting first baseman for the Pittsburgh Pirates, and he's going to be on my team. I'm going to draft him way too high. So you could actually say that Rowdy Telez is overrated because I'm going to draft him so I can guarantee that he's going to be on my team. He doesn't have baseball face. He's got my baseball face. I, I got a, I got a, I got a tight, and it's rowdy. <laughs> All right, Aaron, you're up. Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah. Uh, my overrated. This is strictly for redraft, not for a keeper. Is Vinny Pascontino. Um, he's coming off pretty much shoulder shoulder surgery, and a team in that park. I think where he's going. As, as an overpayment, uh, I think people, I mean, he has really beautiful plate skills, and uh, but we have yet to see it, I know, and I'm worried about his, his health coming off that injury. So for redraft, I would uh, be hesitant to, to pay that price. Um, I think, you know, I'm going to play this card at some point, and we can and make fun of it. For me, I'll play it here at first base. You know, Isak Kratis was the, and this is one of three positions he's eligible at the infield, as the fifth most valuable hitter last year in the American League, I think people uh, are just focused on the flaws that he has and overlooking just how productive and the skills underneath. You know, I look at the skills, I don't see anything in here that says he can't repeat what he did uh, from the swinging strike rate to walk rate, um, you know, hard hit rate. You know, his his bab up was really low, so you can't even say he got lucky. Um, he has a specific skill we talked about in a previous pod, but I just think where he's being ranked and drafted based on uh, his skill and role is, is very underrated. And my, my favorite first baseman is Bryce Harper. Nice. Nice. I have a question about Paredes. I, 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 um, I didn't put him as overrated just because I, I do like his ADP and I do like his multiple position eligibility. Do you think he's good? He could stand out versus other first basemen. Is the first question. The second question. I think there is. Don't you think there's a flaw with how he distributes his hits? So, so um, all he only had one extra base hit to right field all year. 
And do you think teams are going to adjust, pitch him outside and force him to go the opposite way? And does does he actually hit it um, hard enough to uh, to actually um, have some benefit in going the opposite way with power? Because it seems like most of his power is coming from pull side. And I'm asking this as a, as a pro Brady's guy. Um, I like his value, but that's just my hesitation. Aaron, do you have a my 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 response to that? And I'll try to be brief. I know we have a lot of positions to get to. I think his hit tool is uh, is good enough, and he has enough bat path variability um, that he can take the ball the other way. I don't think he can do so with power, um, especially with the ball being changed. Um, but I think one of his biggest attributes last year was his RBIs, um, and he just has really good play skills. So he is very young. And he had 571 plate appearances this year. You know, the only American League first baseman who was more productive than him was Yanni Diaz on his own team. Um, so, yeah, I, I I think he has enough variability, enough hit tool to adjust if they adjust to him. But I think they've also, they're just really smart and they've taught him when you, you know, you need to look for your pitch. And when he does, he tries to do damage. And uh, like I said, he has he has some flaws, but I think he, he has enough skill to evolve. And he's got in the position eligibility. What has he got? Three positions, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's big too. Oh, anybody else got anything at first base? Matt, second base. Let's go. Second base. Okay. Um, got Nico Horner as overrated. Eighty three ADP. He's going to give you steals, but he's going to kill you with OPS and OPS OBP league. Um, and then to make it brief, um, my um, underrated and favorite are the same. It's somebody I traded, but I still love him. Is Marte? Marte is um, tell Marte is 123 ADP. That's a steal as far as I'm concerned. He's going to give give you his consistency. He consistently hits the ball hard. He bats number two in a lineup that continues to improve. He's well protected. Um, I just love him. He. I, I think they'll take a little more risk. His his I think he's faster than his steals showed last year. Um, they laid off um, aggressive base running with him just because of past injury history. But I think they'll be a little more aggressive with the base stealing next year. So, and and I just love him. He comes up clutch. Um, going to the favorite player thing. Um, he was a key part of of Arizona shocking everybody last year. Um, so yeah, I just love Marte. I'm going to miss him, but, um, I had to, um, trade him as far as, um, my age bias, my ageism when it comes to dynasty baseball. I love Marte too. Um, I don't think he's going to run because there's so many leg injuries that I, I think he, those days are over. But one of the thing I do love, one of the things I love about him is that he gets runs and RBIs on top of everything else. So, you know, I think there are others at second base who are great, but you trade one category for the other, and he gets both. Um, my overrated is Matt McClain. I still don't believe in his pedigree. Oh, um, my God. He – so you look at the, the counting stats, right? 400 play, 403 plate appearances, 16 homers, 14 steals. That looks beautiful. Hit 290, 864 OPS. That's great. 28.5% K rate says to me, some of those numbers are coming down. You don't maintain a 29% K rate and have all that other stuff year over year. Um, the other big thing for me was his Babbitt was 385, right? In a small park. So if, if you normalize that for a, even down to 320, right? Which is still a decent Babbitt. And you took 65 points off of his BABIP, and then you took 65 points off of his average. You're talking about a 225 hitter, right? And so I think the power and speed is there. I don't think that the power and speed is going to disappear, but I think the average will. And I certainly think the 864 OPS will. I think I'll be lucky to get to 800 next year. Um, I understand he went to UCLA. I understand he's a first round pick. I understand all those things. Cincinnati Reds Park, all those things. I don't think he is who people think he is. Um, my underrated is Ozzy Albies. I just, 
I think it's really easy to overlook him because of the rest of the players on that offense. And because he would hit a lot of his counting, counting stats were accumulative. Like it was because he had so many plate appearances, not because he had great plate skills. But at this point, he has so many counting stats that who cares about the plate skills last season coming off of injury, the previous season, 96 runs, 33 homers, 109 RBIs, 13 stolen bases, 849 OPS at second base. So whether we like his plate skills or not, those numbers are ludicrous. And so to me, I think Albies needs to be mentioned in, you know, he's up there. He's darn near close to bets at that point in time. Right. And certainly, even though I roster Simeon, I would probably consider putting him over Simeon as well um, because of the power. And then my favorite is uh, I will always love him, Jorge Polanco. I just, I don't know what it is about him as a player. I sincerely hope the Mariners trade for him. I don't think it would take a top prospect to get him from the Twins. But I just, you know, he continues to break my heart because of his injuries. But the power is there, right? The walks are there. He's just... He's learned how to lift the ball. I think he's a really great player. And for whatever reason, I love uh, Jorge Polanco. And I don't love twins ordinarily. <laughs> Since Kirby Puckett. Go ahead, uh, Doug, you're up. Although uh, you you like Buxton for a little bit there. Uh, yes. Knowing. Sorry. That is, you're absolutely correct. 100%. Sorry about that. I had to call you on that. No, you're so, right. So, uh, yeah, real quick, second base. Um, I would have to say just kind of looking at the ADP on this and uh, uh, seeing Bryson Stott. Uh, so uh, so high on that, and then kind of like going, oh, and then he's a free agent uh, in our league, so like maybe he could be picked up in the first round with a with a good high draft pick. And then I looked at his uh, I looked at his numbers, what he did last year, why he kind of uh, deserves such a high ADP, and it's just you know it's just boring, right? It's just kind of you know I think this gets also to the fact that uh, that we don't know how to um, how to look at stolen base stats mm -hmm. now with the, with the new rules on that. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, it's kind of like um, you, you have like a, uh, the world. Okay. The world gets uh, uh, breast implants. Everyone gets breast implants <laughs> one day and you don't know, you haven't gone to Starbucks enough. And the first person you see has these new amazing breasts and you go, Oh my <laughs> God, I'm going to marry you. And then you, <laughs> You, you propose and you have this whole thing. And then you realize after a couple of weeks, you look around and you go, oh man, everyone got breast implants. And this is of course only for people that have a, a certain sexual fetish for breasts. But, uh, but anyway, we don't know how to look at stolen bases. And that's why we rate these guys so highly right now is just that uh, we see that number. It would have looked great on our first wife, but she didn't have it, you know? And now we look at it, we want that. But it's just everywhere, man. And it doesn't mean anything. It is all silicone, you know? So anyway, uh, Glaber, uh, Glaber, Torres, uh, he's he's going to be uh, batting what? Probably cleanup for the Yankees after Soto and Judge. So whoever that guy is, whoever is batting fourth for the Yankees is, uh, is not rated high enough because we don't realize what that lineup's going to do. And I think it's going to be Torres – and so whatever ADP he is right now, I had him at 93 when I looked it up today. It should be a lot better than that because that guy's going to have crazy counting stats. So, uh, and then uh, my favorite second baseman, I got it. It's just, um, it's Vaughn Grissom, second baseman, new second baseman for the Red Sox. I just think that he's going to look really good in a Red Sox uniform. Some people can pull it off. Some people can't. I think that uh, he's going to look really good. And uh, people don't know what he did last year in the minor leagues. I mean, that guy went off mm -hmm. in the minor leagues. Braves should have brought him up. They just, I mean, maybe it was the defense. Maybe they didn't have a spot for him, but the man had an amazing year in AAA last year. So he's just going to rake in Fenway. So anyway, that's it my guy. a lack of power too. That didn't, oh. They didn't bring him up. That's yeah, possible. Possible. I think he only got like eight home runs in AAA last year. So that's a good point. That's a good point. He's a good hitter though. For sure. Yeah. Aaron, you're up. Uh, you guys have done a nice job picking some guys off my list. Uh, so I'll try to keep it fresh. I, I think Andre Simenez is overrated. Um, you know, he posted 1530 last year. You know, he does not hit the ball hard. He does not barrel it. He does not hit it hard consistently. His walk rate is 5.2%. Uh, 
he is, you know, you look at his, his pure speed, he outperforms his speed. Um, I just, I just don't think he is, uh, has enough ability to impact the ball and, and really game changing speed to, to be relied upon, to get overcome the holes in his bat, uh, not holes in his bat, but you know, the lack of, um, impact that he has in his bat. So I think he's a little overrated. I think Nolan Gorman is underrated. Uh, you know, think about like how valuable Brandon Lowe was a couple years ago when you got 35 home runs from second base. Um, his swing strike rate was almost 16% last year. He's only 23 years old. His barrel rate was 16 and a half percent. Um, I just think, you know, you think about what would it have be like to have like a, you know, Kyle Schwarber at second base and how much, you know, impact that could potentially have categorically at that position. I think he's being a little bit underrated. And again, at 23 years old, uh, I think maybe he can uh, improve on some of those issues he had in his first full season. And my favorite uh, second baseman is uh, Mookie Betts. I just, he's such a badass. The fact that he could, you know what, I've been a gold glove right fielder for almost 10 years. I'm just going to go play second base and shortstop and be, you know, amazing there. I, I just, Mookie's incredible. And as long as he plays second base, I don't, he'll be my favorite. He's, he's, he's incredible. Awesome. Anybody got anything else to second? Move on to third. Cool. Matt, third base. Third base. Um, third base, I have Elliot third base, and I think he's overrated when it comes to ADP. Um, he's for Dynasty, he's at 16. Um, I would draft Henderson way above him. Um, Henderson is um right now sitting in Dynasty ADP behind Ellie. I love Ellie. I think he has great ceiling. He has the potential to be a top five player. Um, I'm just not convinced in his swing, his swing path, his um, and his K rate. Um, his K rate still is a huge concern. I think the league adjusted to him in the second half. I love his speed. I love how he hits the crap out of the ball, but I want to see him um, have better discipline. Unfortunately, with um, with historically with stats with the minors, the one thing that remains consistent between minor league performance and major league performance is is um, K rate. It's not something that necessarily historically has been improved upon. I'm cheering for him. I think he'd be great for baseball if he succeeds. I'm also concerned too. Um, a player that I'm going to have on my own team that later as an outfield um, that I think. Um, also has a similar issue is um, Carter with Texas. Um, Carter has a hard time versus um, lefties. I think um, Ellie, when he turns around, has a hard time as well. His splits are are not good. Um, so um, yeah, so I, I this is largely very much like Will Smith based upon Dynasty ADP. I, I still think Ellie's worth an investment, but not at at sixteen overall. Um, at underrated, I would say Moncada. Um, he is being drafted in Dynasty Leagues at 388. Uh, Tito's laughing because Tino is going to die on that hill as 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 his prospect. But um, I think he's a great skill at 388. He still has a, a lead a lead up skill, uh, and um, he had a great um, he had a great August September last year. Um, you know, <laughs> can, can the White Sox establish any any of uh, any consistency? I don't know, but but I would I, at three eighty eight. I would get Mankata, and then uh, my favorite would be uh, would be Alex Bregman at um, his ADP is eighty seven. Maybe that's a little high, but I, I just like uh, that Bregman is um, he gets a bad rap because of what happened, especially from all these Dodger fans. Um, but um, he's a he's a social justice guy living in Texas, quite vocal about it, um, consistent. Um, he's kind of, I would call Paredes maybe a Bregman light. Bregman has, has um, I think a, a lot of things over Paredes if we're going to put him at third base, but um, they're very similar. Most of his power comes from the pole side. I think Bregman can take it opposite way if he wants. It's more of a doubles guy too, um, opposite way. And I just love his plate discipline. He's going to give you OBP with his walks. But I just love watching him. I think um, I, I I absolutely despised him until I found out about his background and his both his parents are um, civil rights lawyers as well. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. So 
I'm a Bregman guy. He's just like Marte. Um, I'm sad that I traded him. Probably the I think it's the right move. I think it's a trade high with Bregman. He's one of my favorites at third. Yeah, you traded him because he's over 25 years old. I'm just pointing that out. Is he the Leo DiCaprio of our league? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> he is. That's exactly right. <laughs> Good one. All right. Uh, overrated. This, to me, was pretty simple. Josh Young, third baseman of the Rangers, I think is vastly overrated. Um, he did have 75 runs, 23 homers, and 70 RBIs last season. But when you – and he hit 266. When you dig – and you see a, a sub-6% walk rate and a 29.3% K rate, you know that, you know, those two numbers combined are a recipe for disaster. He also, his BABIP was 340. And so he got lucky with a lot of bad ball, of balls in play. Um, to me, he is your prototypical, like, run-of-the-mill, 20-home run, third baseman that is not going to hit for very good average. And I think in that Texas lineup, he will drop further and further and further as he um, plays worse and worse. So I, I, I'm not a fan of Josh Young. I never really have been. And I don't think the plate skills are there for him to be a star. I think he is just a dude as far as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, underrated. I think, you know, we've talked about him as an MVP candidate at times. I don't think he's regarded as highly as some of the others at this point, but Rafael Devers is just good. Yeah. Right? He's just good. And there are some things about his profile to not love, you know, sub 80% zone contact. There's debate as to whether that's an important stat or not to me. It can be, um, you know, sub 10% walk rate. He doesn't strike out as much as you would think, but he's good for like 90 and hundred basically every single year. And he seems to stumble into 30 home runs. Um, I love Devers. I think Devers is underrated. I think he slept on a bit. You want to compare for me Devers to like a Machado at this point in time? I think Devers hands down. Um, and then my favorite is Gunnar Henderson. I just, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of his coming up. I thought he was my number, like my in my top three prospects for a long time, but it was mostly because he couldn't ignore his talent. But at 22, he put up 100 runs, 20 homers, 82 RBIs, and 10 steals. And I remember at the beginning of the year him really scuffling, right? Like he really did not start up, start the season very well. And to come back and post those kinds of numbers, I think, just shows, his, one, his physicality, right? The, the power and the speed are for real. And it's not wishing him to have power and speed. I think his power and speed are plus. Um, He's on a fun team. I also think it's interesting that he that he will probably maintain shortstop eligibility for quite a while. And so to have somebody with dual eligibility like that is is nice. So Henderson is, as of right now, is my favorite third baseman. Um, I will also say for our league's sake, uh, as much as I love the numbers that Austin Riley puts up for my team, I don't necessarily love him as a player. I, I feel... He's that player where I feel slightly dirty for rostering him because I don't love him, but I know that he's good. So uh, the right offer can pry Austin Riley from me. Oh, good to know, man. Thank you for that. You're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> Doug, you're up. All right. I think, yeah, I'm the last one. This one. Uh, so real quick, um, just looking at ADP for third baseman, uh, Royce Lewis, um, you know, uh, he's my overrated guy just because, uh, I mean, I'm sure he's going to be great. I'm sure he's never going to get injured again for the rest <laughs> of his career. But for uh, for what his sample size that he's put up, I mean, I know that he was like, we're, we've been waiting for him for years and years to show up. And he kind of did last year. But, I mean, just, I don't know. That's just too small of a sample size, the success that he had. Just too short for uh, – I, I saw an ADP today of uh, 47 on that. And, you know, um, it's just – I you know, people love him. He did good in, in their uh, their short stint in the playoffs with the Twins. But I just think that that's just uh, – we just don't know enough about him. And then, of course, he's probably just going to break himself again. So that's a, that's a risky pick uh, so early in the draft. And then um, uh, underrated, I would have to say uh, Jake Berger. Right. He uh, he uh, came from uh, the White Sox. No one really likes the White Sox. 
Um, and then where is he? Uh, he's uh, with Miami. Miami. Yep. Yeah. No one really likes Miami either. So these are like, he went from like one, like kind of like afterthought team to another. And I think I'm not entirely sure. Maybe I'm getting this because of his last name, but I think he's kind of a pear shaped player. <laughs> yes. And uh, so, so I think that that's probably bringing him down too. But like, I look at his numbers and I go, man, that's, you know, like, that's someone that someone should have as a third baseman. Maybe I don't want him as a third baseman because I like more of a, um, you know, like an inverse triangle kind of body shape. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I just think that that, that people are bringing him down quite a bit. Um, anyway, uh, favorite third baseman, uh, uh, Nolan Arenado. Um, I think that every time I've seen him at the plate, his energy is just crazy. Like he just, he, he looks very scary and like he's going to hit, like he's going to pull a home run. Uh, to left field and uh anyway i uh he's great he's great but uh i guess he's getting old but uh people don't people don't uh respect that crazy energy that he has anymore so anyway that's my guy aaron you're up <clears throat> my overrated third baseman is alec bohm um i think he had like his best possible outcomes last year but i think when you from third base when you have a 5.7 percent barrel rate and a walk rate of seven percent he has no speed you know he posted 20 home runs and i think with his his uh his power you know he had a 163 iso i think that's about as best as you can expect and so for him you know i saw he was like the 12th uh ranked third baseman i think you could get that pretty easily off you know off the waiver wire late in the draft i don't think he's worth that pick um, but however, he plays on a really good team and uh, is, is credit to him for becoming a more adequate third base defensively. But I think he's overrated there uh, for my underrated. I'm going to take the exact opposite position of Doug. This is why he's like a 14 time champion and I'm a perennial bridesmaid. But I think uh, Royce Lewis is underrated. Um, you know, you you went down Gunner's skills. I think you put them side by side. Uh, they're very similar players. Royce is two years older. Um, I think Royce has the capital C charisma that, you know, Julio has, that Ronald Cunha has, uh, that Ellie has, you know, um, I think he's got the it factor. And um, I, I think at the end of the year, uh, we're going to look back and, and think that he was a steal wherever he went, even if it's 47th overall. Um, he's, he's someone who's who I would bet on. I think he's under he's being undervalued because of his injury history. Um, but anyway. Uh, my favorite third baseman uh, is Cabrian Hayes. You know, my life got a lot happier and a lot more balanced when I let go of my stake in him as a fantasy player. I can just enjoy him for what he is. He's an amazing defender. Uh, he's a quiet guy, really hard worker. Um, you know, and I just, I, I love Cabrian. I love the way he carries himself, the way he plays. And, and uh, hopefully one day he'll, he'll get to some of the power in his bat. Uh, but even if he doesn't, I will always love him. We should have the Whitney Houston, uh, the Whitney Houston Award, the I Will Always Love You Award. <laughs> Seriously, like <laughs> that's a good one. One of my like one of my one of my favorite memories in baseball the last five years is going to a Pirates game and sitting on third base and just watching him field and yeah, uh, even you know yeah it was it was I'm so glad I did that. It's awesome. He's. I know. I think we all are just waiting for him to hit 30 home runs in a lot of ways. Um, let's hit shortstop. Matt, you want to get started? Wait, hold on. Doug, Doug, you weren't there for the uh, Royce Lewis. Count no, no, I, I heard the whole thing. I heard you the did. whole thing. Yeah, okay. no, I, I, it's, uh, my whole thing is just with him is that uh, uh, I guess it's just the injuries, right? That's just that's just my whole thing He's on made that. Out of paper <laughs> mache. Yeah, I agree. Look how his sprint speed too compared to other third basemen. Lower Pace. than I thought. But, Pace, um, you mean? Yeah, no. Um, Lewis. Lewis, yeah. Hey, Lewis is sick. Look at the home runs to plate appearances last season. Like at, at nine forty one OPS and two hundred forty one plate appearances. He's for real. It's just it's I don't know. Some some of us I think what it comes down to. Obviously, we can't really debate his skill. It's just some of us have the stomach for taking you know, for having players that have that kind of injury, you know, potential or injury history. And some of us don't, and that, but yeah. I think his plate skills yeah. are undeniable. He was the number one pick for a reason for sure. Uh, Matt shortstop. Shortstop. Um, 
I hate to say this um, for overrated because I'm a Nats fan, but CJ Abrams um, comes to overrated. Um, I like his speed. I don't like what I'm not convinced as far as his on base percentage nor um, his future contribution for an OPS league. His power um, definitely showed in the second half. Um, but I'm not convinced he's he's as high as hit tool power tool as originally advertised, and he's not in a good organization necessarily with a track record for developing that. Um, if you look at his sprint speed too, I think his speed is somewhat. Um, you know, I I think his speed is attributed to his base base running skills. He's not um he's not an elite um sprint speed player um i think that's somewhat overrated but i still think he could give you 15 20 home runs um 50 steals i think that's worth it at short but um but i'm not convinced he's ever going to get over 800 ops um unless he does something drastic with his plate discipline he has great he has decent contact rates i think his um his strikeout rate was under 20 percent last year 19 um but yeah, I just see him kind of as this this contact hitter that will take advantage of getting on base through that. Um, his EVs, I don't think necessarily support the power surge. Um, I would pay for him, but not at um, 53 ADP in a dynasty draft. Yeah. Um, so um, I think he's a good sell high. Um, and Doug, Doug, um, Doug sold him high. And this leads to my second person who Doug chose um I, I guess i'm trying to get a bourbon from you in the, in this segment here um <laughs> i have volpe at 84 i would rather ra- wait for 84 with volpe um i think he does have the plate patient patience he's not as fast as abrams but he's just as keen when it comes to um, base running ability and base stealing ability um i think he could work his way into that lineup um He's going to be very low this year, but I think he could work his way up in that lineup. I, I'm still confident in him. His um, his hit is not a 209 batting average. Um, as far as, yeah. He hit 140 with the 263 slug against the slider. He hit 108 with the 162 slug against the curveball. And he hit 200 with the 333 slug against the sweeper. Hey, you didn't tell me that last week, man. I didn't need to. <laughs> That's all you. And I watched a ton of his plate appearances, obviously, and I'm rooting for him, and, and the, the homers and steals are still there. But I think when you have that kind of – those kinds of numbers against breaking balls in general, that's a – like, I take pause, right? Those are bad numbers. And he's young, but, you know, if he's if he is indeed one of those hits the fastball, can't hit, hit anything with spin – that's that's a scary proposition. That said, he's still 2020 20, kind of in the bank, and that's obviously yeah. super valuable. And still young. Yes. They have those Very same numbers so. in the minors versus off speed, right? Very much so. And and the Yankees the Yankees development is not um is not on part of it, especially with with how the hitters do in the minors, and then when they come up, mm-hmm. it's just disaster when it comes with um, with off speed pitches and right. um, plate discipline and contact. So, so is that something they're going to fix? I don't know. That's so, anyway, happens, um, when, but when but, but still, it comes to value. Coach. I would pay. Abrams is going to be, you know, Volpe's could be 20, 30, 20, 40. Abrams is going to be. 1560 right. would i rather pay volpe at 84 to 90 in the dynasty yeah than than pay in the in the fourth round for abrams um the one positive i think aaron and i aaron and i talked about this earlier would <coughs> their potential of abrams moving back to second um i i think his his value would shoot up as a second baseman um or at least support that at 53 um, and my favorite is O'Neill Cruz. Um, yeah. He's right now at 45 Absolutely. dynasty. He, he's going to be the breakout this year for me. I, I I would like to kind of see Cruz hand in hand with Ellie and see who has a better year. Both of them have similar builds. Both of them have similar power. Um, Ellie's probably a little faster than Cruz. I like how um, Cruz is staying at short. Pittsburgh said he's going to stick it short, which which will be interesting as well. 
he has that rocket arm, which is fun to watch. Um, so I'm going to be um, rooting for Cruz this year. I love it. I thought about O'Neill Cruz too. I just, he's such a, a one-off type of player. It's so interesting to watch him play similar to Ellie, right? As you said, but Cruz is also like not, or Cruz is, is strong, right? Ellie's wiry strong, like Eric Davis. Cruz is like a big dude. Um, my overrated is JP Crawford. I, uh, I thought about some other players, but I think Crawford's overratedness is too much to ignore. Um, and I love him, right? I'm self-admitted, like huge Mariners fan. But when you look at two steals, right, and, and no real speed to speak of, and he's going to hurt you in RBIs when you compare him to other top players, it's not worth, it's not worth it, right? And the 19 home runs last year were great. And he went to driveline, well-documented, but you don't know if those 19 home runs are going to continue. Also, he achieves them by swinging the bat as hard as he can. And I don't love to see that from players when they're swinging the bat as hard as they can to hit home runs. I just think there are – that he's maxed out physically in what he's doing. And what that means is 19 homers and two steals from a position that I need more, more from. So he's my overrated. He also, like I said, RBIs, you're going to have to make up for it elsewhere. Um, underrated is, and this sounds silly to say because he plays in New York and has a huge contract, but Francisco Lindor, um, 108 runs, 31 homers, 98 RBIs, 31 steals, right? Counting stats galore. And despite the fact that he's on Sunday night baseball every single night, every single Sunday and has, is mic'd up and all those things. I just don't think we talk about him enough as being as great as he is. That's a 30-30 season, almost 100-100 at the shortstop position. Um, and that to me is phenomenal. Uh, it's A lot of it is counting stats, but still, I think Lindor is great. Um, and then my favorite shortstop is by far uh, Bobby Witt Jr. I just, the physicality that he plays with and what I mean by that is he's so strong and he's so fast and he 30 homers and 49 stolen bases from a 23 year old is, is just is phenomenal to me. And yes, he doesn't walk enough. Yes. You know, he has some flaws to his game, but you're talking about like a Cunha light at shortstop. Right. 30 feet. He was one steal away from 30 50 last year and three runs and four RBIs away from 100 100. Playing for the Royals of all teams. I just think his talent is endless and I I love him. He's super fun to watch. I just I think he's phenomenal. I think he's explosive. Um, and fantasy wise, obviously, he's just a, he's a superstar. Doug. Uh, yeah, for uh, shortstop overrated, I got uh, Ha Sung Kim on the on the Padres. I think that this is uh, another instance of we don't know right now how to view stolen bases. He went uh, 17 home runs, 36 stolen bases last year. He had like a, a 250 something or other average, and that just you know propels him to this uh, crazy high. I think in my mind. ADP where I think that 36 stolen bases is something that when we look at it and we see it, we kind of go, Oh my God, that would have been awesome last year. But 36 is, you know, is not, uh, I don't know. I just, I, I see that as kind of uh, uh, confusing people on that. Maybe after a couple of years, we're going to start seeing 36 stolen bases as like, okay, you know, especially from a shortstop. So I don't know. I just, I, I like him. I think he's good. I think that the numbers kind of came a little bit out of nowhere last year. I think that that might be his ceiling. So uh, you're, you're buying like his peak year and, and, uh, and next year you're going to be a little bit disappointed. So, uh, you know, I still like him, but I think he's overrated. Um, I don't like this guy, uh, but I think he's underrated. Uh, Trevor's story. I think that, uh, you know, there was sky high expectations for him when he signed with Boston. Uh, he was injured. Uh, all last year, even when he came back, you know, he had some flourishes, but, uh, but you know, it, I think he was still coming off an injury. I think he's had time to heal now. And this is the Trevor story that, uh, that Boston thought they were signing in the first place. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing to see. I mean, just with name on name alone, seeing 
Trevor's story, you know, going, uh, I had, uh, I saw an ADP uh, 177 on that. So that, that seems like a good, uh, a good buy low for me there. And who knows, maybe I might pick him up, get uh, the whole Boston infield if I could. Um, <laughs> but I think that my, my favorite shortstop, uh, Ellie de, de la Cruz, um, I haven't seen too many games of his, but I did see uh, a clip on Twitter that was him stealing uh, all three bases. And uh, and that was kind of like the most uh, amazing thing that I saw last year in uh, as far as a highlight clip of that guy doing what he could do on the base paths. And uh, I think someone said it before that he's, uh, you know, he's good for baseball, could be a top five eventually on that. But I think that uh, if I was going to go to a baseball game, I would, I would want to see him playing, uh, playing, playing ball. So that's my favorite. Nice. Mr. Alves. Well, you, you know, Tino, from podcasting with me, Wood Drum, I'm going to be uh, Boba Shut is my overrated shortstop. <laughs> um, you know, he's 25 years old, so he's entering his peak season. But I think he, he continues to slow down uh, in terms of speed. Uh, his ISO was 168, and a lot of his approach is going the other way. His pull rate was only 26%. Uh, and uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, the ball, the way the ball has been adjusted, the pull, you know, going opposite way power uh, is is something to be diminished. So he has to get to the pull side to get to his power. Mm -hmm. And so he has to accumulate to get to his counting stats. So he had 20 home runs last year, 69 runs, 73 RBI, but he didn't play a full season. So for him to really be valuable, uh, he has to play, you know, 650, 700 plate appearances. He can accumulate all those runs and RBIs. Um, but yeah, I just don't think – I think he's a good player. He has a good hit tool, um, and I certainly value that. But I think what it costs to acquire him, you're, you're really not getting any speed, um, and you're getting a medium amount of power, and you're relying on him to uh, accumulate a lot of runs in RBI to be worth uh, his his price. Um, I think underrated uh, – sorry to be a repeat, but it's Francisco Lindor for all the reasons you mentioned – you know, a 30-30 season in New York is pretty hard to be undervalued, but I think he is. Uh, and uh, my favorite shortstop, it will surprise no one, uh, it's Corey Seager. Uh, he's kind of a unicorn at the position. He's been told a lot, you know, because he doesn't run, he's not valuable in fantasy. Uh, he was told he can't stay at shortstop, and he's changed his body, and he has. Um, he's now won two World Series rings, and I think he gets a lot of flack for being a quiet person, for not wanting to be in the spotlight. But I think he's just an amazing hitter. And I think what he does at the plate is pretty unique. Uh, you know, he swings so much. He gets some some people criticize him for that. But he has an approach. And he knows what he's doing up there. And, um, yeah, I just – I think he's he's a, he's a tremendous, tremendous hitter. And I think anyone who would argue that is just not being fair to him. Can't debate that. Uh, Aaron, do you have time to be outfield? Uh, wow. yeah, let's do it. All, All right. right, let's do outfield. Matt, why don't you get us started? Actually, Aaron, why don't you get us started since you have a a uh, time commitment? No, I gotta reset my sheet for outfield. You don't want to start with me. I gotta get. I gotta get set up. <laughs> no worries, Matt. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um. So I have two overrated. Um, one, um, I don't think he's overrated if you play him on first base, but it's Jones for Colorado. Um, Jones, um, Jones's K rate doesn't match um, what his output was last year. I don't like um, the way he is going to be developed in Colorado. He does have a pretty swing, um, and this is going to lead into my underrated guy, but. Um, and he does have decent speed. A lot of this goes to base running. His sprint speed is is in the 70 percentile. Um, a lot of people think, you know, just by watching him, it's higher. But um, he doesn't have that elite speed that everybody talks about. Um, I like him, but he's not 58 on ADP. Um, somebody around that same er area in ADP is Evan Carter, who I do in, do roster in many leagues. I just think that's too high for him as far as provenness. I was somebody after St. Louis won um, the World Series with David Freeze with that great year. I was one of the guys that bought into David Freeze the next year. 
players are very different over the course of the year versus how they are in clutch um, World Series, unfortunately, or clutch in, in playoffs. I What I do, why I did trade for Carter, though, is I do like his speed. I think he's one of those guys that nobody really knew what his speed was until it was measured. Um, he's baseball America shifted him from 80, I mean, 60 grade speed to 80 grade speed. Um, and that's proven by the data. He's number three or four in the entire league and going from, from home to first. Um, and he's number four in, in overall speed grade and savants. Um, he's 97, 98 percentile with speed. What I like about that is obviously the on-base percentage, um, that he does offer why I'm cr criticizing him. We don't know how he does versus, versus left-handed pitchers because he's not given opportunity. Um, um, and you know, is that something he could develop? I don't know. Um, he has somebody on his heels coming up. That is a strong righty, um, um, that is going to challenge him. Can, is he going to platoon there? We don't know, but anyway, I think he gets a lot of hype because of, because of the playoffs and because of the world series, I think it's a good investment, but not in the in 58, 60 range. Um, to move to somebody that is a lefty that I think is underrated when it comes to prospects. Um, Tino's gonna laugh, but this is Delauder for Cleveland. Um, his average draft position is 204 um versus a Carter and Jones who are in the 60s. Um Delauder's swing is criticized, but if you look carefully at it, um, he's quick once he gets there. Um, his splits, he's that's that's quick and he's quick and strong. Um, and his his metrics support that. In the AFL, he had um, he had one of the best EVs, um, ninety percentile EV when it comes to EV um, average EV and um, the home runs he hit were um, close to one ten. So um, he has elite contact. He's always at every level. Um, walked more than he's K just about. Um, so we can look at swing, but my, if you look at Jones, pretty swing, Carter, pretty swing, um, Delauder not, but Delauder's metrics and his numbers, um, back, back what, what he's, what he shows. So, um, what, um, what I'm saying, 204, I, I would do that. Um, and where he's ranked in outfield prospects, I think is way too low. Um, and then my favorites will go with um, J-Rod, um, just because of one play. Um, this is when I had Tatis on my team. Tatis hit a long fly ball to center field. I thought it was going to be a home run. I thought that was going to win me the week. And um, J-Rod went up, and I thought he missed it, and he pretended that he missed Tatis's um, home run to center field. And about what, maybe ten or fifteen seconds later, he showed that he got the ball. So I kind of, I, I just love that kind of spirit, and it makes baseball fun, even though it pissed me off at the moment. Um, I just like that um, the playfulness that that J Rod has, along with the intensity as well. Awesome. Um, besides the latter part, <laughs> I just if you haven't seen his swing, I think if you roster him and he plays well for you. You need to like take a second shower every day. I just I I there's I can't do it, man. It's like taking Rick Barry in fantasy basketball and winning free throw the free throw category every single week. It's hey man, not bad. Jim Jim Furyk. Yeah, that's Jim Furyk can golf. Ugly swing, great golfer. You can keep chase the ladder. Um, <laughs> my overrated is Mike Trout. I think. People have to have real con real conversations with themselves about what Mike Trout actually is now, which is a broken down power hitter with no more speed, at least from a stolen base standpoint. Um, even in 22, when he hit 40 home runs and 499 plate appearances, he only had 80, 85 runs and 80 RBIs, right? He's a he, and he's on a really bad offense at this point in time. So even if he hits 40 home runs, I don't see him play like the counting stats aren't there. And the speed since 2020, one steal, two, two steals, one steal, two steals, right? The days of Mike Trout being a 40-40 player, the days of him being a speed threat are just gone. Um, we've also seen an, uh, 
his elevated strikeout rate over the last three years. So he's he was a superstar. I just don't think he's that anymore. Um, and, and he's going to suffer from Shohei Otani not being on the Angels anymore. Um, Ian Happ is my underrated player. I just, he's fun for me. I love a good walk rate guy. Uh, two of the last three years, he's had 20 home, 20 plus home runs, 21 home runs last season, 86 runs, 84 RBIs, 14 steals, 14.3% walk rate, and a 791 OPS, right? When you say the name Ian Happ, that's not necessarily what you think of. Um, and I think as an outfield three or as a utility type player, I think there's really good value there. Um, really in any type of league. I just, I like him as a player a lot. Um, he's a good union guy too. He's a what? Good union guy. Is he really? I didn't know that. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. That's he's awesome. one of our vocal players. Um, and then my favorite, you know, I, the easy one would be J-Rod. Uh, you guys, everyone knows my love for J-Rod, so I'll leave it at that. Um, but the one that I w wanted to talk about is Jordan Alvarez. Um, again, yes, I'm courting Jordan Alvarez to a certain extent here, but he's like, and I said this, was it last year or two years ago, Aaron, where Jordan Alvarez's batted ball metrics were the same as Aaron Judge, essentially. Yes, and yes. He's just, he's 26 years old. He's entering his physical prime. I get the bad knees, makes sense. But the dude hits the ball so hard. And he's hes a technician at the plate, right? He reminds me of like a, like a savant quarterback that can process defenses quicker than everybody else. He just, he knows, he can identify the pitches that are coming. He's such a great hitter for being so powerful. And I really admire that in him. I just, I think he's a, an amazing, amazing player. And um, and this is coming from a staunch Mariners fan talking about a Houston Astro, right? The dude better be good. I just, I think Jordan is is phenomenal and um, and a really cool player to watch. And I'm glad we traded Robbie Ray. There you go. Doug. You're up. So that it's, I got to tell you, I'm so glad that I'm uh, right after you on this. I, I did, you know, prepare for, for each one of these uh, categories. So I'm not doing this just to kind of fuck with you on this, but uh, uh, my overrated is Ian Happ and my underrated <laughs> is Mike Trout. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. So All right, I want to uh, know why. Is it the face? Like, what? If, give me the justification well, obviously here. It's the face. No, no. It's. <laughs> But my, it's it's just one thing on on Ian Happ. I had him for the second half of last year, and um and the one thing that he did for me was that uh he batted third, he consistently batted third in the second half. And the Cubs have a new manager now, so whatever whatever he had over the last manager's head on this, I don't think that that works out anymore. And I see that guy, uh, uh his counting stats just going in the toilet. Because he's probably going to be batting sixth or maybe seventh uh, in that Cubs lineup. He's not batting third, that's for sure. And uh, hey, 250, anyway. 250, 341, 482 with an 822 slug and a 122 WRC plus in the second half. Yeah, yeah, not bad, man. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, if if you look at the RBIs and you look at the at the runs, those things are just they're they're going downhill. And those are two categories that we actually have. We don't have uh, Babbitt in our league. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, I just I just look at his his place in the lineup is suspect uh, from last year to this year, and uh, and then Mike Trout. I just I, I looked at that. I I looked up his ADP before we got on here, and uh, on the like national you know redraft uh, ADP on that it was seven. And, and Mike Trout at 70, I just think that that would be, you know, obviously with the injuries, he doesn't steal bases anymore, although he still has uh, good sprint speed, uh, that I just feel that uh, that would be a risk or a gamble that I'd be willing to take, is that if I got uh, if I got Mike Trout at pick number 70 in a redraft league, I would take that all day long. So I was just you're looking pro at pro steroid uh, is what you're saying. What's that? You're pro steroid is what you're saying. <laughs> He he does he does have that kind of look to him, doesn't he? His his body's breaking down too, really early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see. I'm interested in seeing, and and plus part of the gamble would be like what what uh, what he's gonna do without Otani, you right. know? 
and just kind of like being the sole guy there. And then, and then plus I have a little thing for the, uh, for the angels this year. Cause I, uh, I like Ron Washington. So I, I kind of, I'm going to be rooting for him. So uh, I'm sorry. Everybody I, too. Are broken. I like him too. What was that Aaron? I said, I'm sorry. You're rooting for the angels. You're setting yourself up for heartbreak. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not going to root for it. It's going to be a casual, like kind of like, you know, uh, I'm going to uh, call them up sure. late at night and just kind of see how they're doing, you know, no commitment yeah. whatsoever. Are you yeah. say, are you awake sort of uh are you still awake sort of relationship? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um I'm sure you don't. <laughs> anyway, uh my favorite outfielder, Aaron, I think I'd like to do this. I don't know if we can uh make it happen, but I'd like just uh no one to own Stephen Kwan except me and you on that. I we've done that with a few other players. Uh, but uh I like that guy. If you if you watch any interviews with him. He's got like facial tics galore. He's got like his he's got too much uh uh nervous energy and 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 quick muscle tissue. And uh anyway, I, I think that uh that he's gonna be a fun player that's gonna finally turn it around one year and maybe hit, you know, 340 uh leading off for the uh for the Guardians. But uh anyway, I, I I've always liked him and uh if we can keep it in the family, Aaron, I think that, that would be a good thing. Oh, please do, please do. It's gonna be good for the Good for um, low competition there. <laughs> All right, Aaron, you're up. All right. Um, so I'm going to do something kind of different with this. Um, so I'm going to take two players from the same team. Um, my uh, overrated is Randy Rosarina. Uh, my underrated is Josh Lowe. Uh, you look at their you look at their performance side by side. Um, I will take low 10 times out of a 10 and he costs less. Uh, he's 25 years old. He had 32 steals and was only caught three times. Whereas uh, Randy 22 was 10 times from a power perspective, you know, uh, low was ISO um, and I uh, see his barrel rate here. Sorry. Lost track of my, his barrel rate was 11%. So, you know, watching Randy Rosen alive, he cannot hit right-handed pitching. He is super streaky, hits the ground on the bound, hits the ball on the ground a ton. Josh Lowe's off jingle is optimized. Um, you know, he does have more, a little bit more swing and miss than Randy. But I just watching uh, a fair amount of Rays games as I do, uh, especially late in the games, when to see if Fairbanks comes in, you know, that kind of thing. Lowe is clutch, and I, I really like him, and I think he can hit left-handed pitching. You know, whether the Rays, I think he gets downgraded because the Rays just assume they're going to platoon him, but he wasn't platoon towards the end of the year. Frankly, he was one of their best hitters uh, last year towards the end of the year. So, um, I would, again, I would take him 10 times out of a 10 or a Rosarina at the same price, and he has way lower costs. Um, for my favorite outfielder, you 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 talked about, I was going to talk about Stephen Kwan. Uh, he is probably my favorite Um uh, fantasy wise, it's not great. I learned that the hard way. Um, but as a as a, similar to Cabrian Hayes, like uh, Stephen Kwan is one of my just absolute favorite players. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I'm only gonna trade him to you when I draft him this year. I'll I'll keep him for a little bit, and I'll only trade him to you. Very well. Aaron's nice. like, nah, bro, I'm good. Aaron, <laughs> Aaron, I've, I've already had the Stephen Kwan experience. I'm gonna pass that on to you. <laughs> I have an Aaron question here. So, since you do currently roster both Quan and Lee, and both are compared to one another, who has a better year, Lee in his first year with the Giants or Quan with the Indians? Oh boy, fantasy wise <laughs> or real life wise? Both, yeah. Just who? I think. Um... I mean, I think you have to take Quan Lee get an adjustment year, but Lee's the I don't think we want to get. Yeah, I I think Lee is. I don't know. He's I think he's he's still evolving as a hitter. He had twenty three home runs the the year before he got fractured his ankle. Uh, he's he's just really interesting. He has incredible bat to ball, and he's he's Ooh. coming into his size. But you know, he he swings like Ken Griffey. He wears number fifty one like Ichiro. I, he's he's just um he's a really fun fun player. Mm -hmm. Aaron, is this it for you then? 
I needed to call it. It breaks my heart not to be able to talk pitching, but I have to be up to start roasting coffee and I can't rob myself sleep to start a, start a week on a Monday. Got so it. I'm on the wrong coast. I apologize, but I, yeah, I got to call it. No worries. Right, man. No worries. We got to do it again soon. Yeah. Great to talk to you guys. Good to have yeah. you, man. Good to see you. All right, fellas. Ah. Uh... <laughs> Let's move to pitching. I'm going to leave it there. Let's move to pitching. Uh, Matt, why don't you start us off most overrated? Now I'm going to be a betrayer. I feel bad. Um, so overrated will be the new Dodger um, glass now. Um, he's <laughs> ADP at 56. Um, I, I I think I could I could recite his metrics all night. Um, yeah. they're, they're great. My biggest concern is at age 30 going into 31 this year, um, his max innings pitched is what one was last year, right? 121 30. Um, that's not good news. Um, even if the Dodgers do something with him and he, and let's say he, he breaks the 140 mark this year, the question next year as a dynasty player is, is he going to be able to, to sustain that, right? Because it's going to be a, a lot of work on his arm. So um, my biggest concern is, 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 is at 56, is he going to offer you, offer you what you want for a top 10 pitcher, which is, is where he's at there. Right. Um, if you compare a pitcher similar to his age, that may not have the, the sexy stuff is Aaron Nola, right? Right. Nola's at a at a worse part, but but the guy is consistent and he's going to give you 180 innings a year. He's going to strike out enough guys and he's going to give you what you could depend upon for a top 10 pitcher um or top 15, top 20 no matter, you know, where you want to want to place him. So, I've glass now there. Did you want to jump in, Tino? I did. I I think that one of my takeaways from this podcast already is the skills versus health conversation. And I just think it's one that really does define who you are as a fantasy manager, right? If you're one extreme or the other, and it's just, I don't think it's difficult to identify skill, right? If you look at the right stats and you understand what stats to look for, it's not hard to find, to find skill, especially if you're willing to couple that with, with some video scouting. But health is just another thing. It's a whole nother, you know, we've had this conversation about tons of players. I didn't bring it up about Seager while Aaron was here. And I, I'm sorry to bring it up now, but I love Corey Seager too. I think he hits the crap out of the ball. Problem is he's never healthy, right? And so what do you do with the, with the shortstop, with the over 1,000 OPS who can't stay healthy? It's just... Health is a skill as much as anything else. It's why I think Lindor, like I said, is underrated. It's why Devers is underrated. It's why Albies, you know, if you subtract his 2022, is underrated. It's why, like I said, I can't trade Freeman and Semyon, even though I don't love either of them, because they put up 700 plate appearances. It's why Castillo, I think, is important. It's why Kirby's important. It's why it, it's just... Health is a thing, right? And so Glass now can throw 100 miles an hour and his stuff is nasty as hell. But what are you giving up for him in fantasy if he's never going to be healthy? Or if you can't count on him not Dave Dravecking himself, you know, off the mound, essentially. It's just, I don't know. I, I think it's a debate that has to be had. And strategically for home leagues, if you can identify which managers are skills-based in which one favor health, I think it can take you a long ways um, as far as being able to negotiate with those particular managers. You guys have more thoughts on health or out skills versus versus health? I don't know. Like I was saying with uh, with Trout on that, I just feel that uh, that sometimes it's just kind of a, a feel mm -hmm. on that where, you know, you're just going, okay, you know, like, well, there's no feel to uh, to Buxton, right? He's sure. he's just a uh, he's he's just gonna get injured, right? But some people, you know, like I I sold I sold low on Judge a couple of years ago, thinking that this guy was just gonna be a perennial uh, you know uh, IR guy, 
and just uh, and I don't think that you know aside from the toe last year, he's been relatively healthy. So you know it's kind of just hit or miss on that, and a lot of it is feel. I think on on uh, on what you're trying to do with health. Right. Yeah, we're just not a ratio league, and I'm I'm happy we aren't a ratio league because because that if for a ratio league it doesn't reflect the reality of the game, right? Health yeah. is part of is part of winning. And I, it goes back to what one of the things that got me into fantasy baseball was playing the old dice games with APBA, right? I, I would always get Ken Phelps. I think it was in 84, 80, 85, because he he had these great ratios. And, and, uh, and you could play him for tons of games, even though he didn't play all the games, right? And um, and we you can't count on that in fantasy in a non-ratio league. because right. Because they're they're not going to consistently give you that distribution each week, the twenty weeks of regular season, and then if you make the playoffs for the for the three or four weeks after. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I played I played uh, eighty seven Strato, and I can't remember the the card that it was, but it wasn't anyone. Uh, it wasn't a superstar, but it was the guy that had these crazy ratios with the small number of at bats. That was like the all star of of Strato for for eighty seven. So right. yeah, I, I, think- I like that we're not in a ratio league either. I played Dynasty and Pursue the Pennant, and Hal Morris was amazing against right-handed pitching, right? Dave Magadan, amazing versus right-handed pitching. Jerry Brown, the old second baseman for the A's and the Rangers, like he he could get on base against righties. And then you would find your lefty mashers, and you would just run these platoons out there all the time. And it was – it's just – Baseball is health is so much more a factor in baseball, and especially now, I think, because pitchers specifically throw at 100 percent all the time, whereas, you know, pitching nine innings mattered before. And so they would be more likely to throw at 85 percent. It's just guys get hurt. Our human bodies are not supposed to throw overhand in general, let alone as hard as they do. So right. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm like the like the high man on health at the, at the table, but I just, I think it's huge. I think it's super duper duper important, right? Your whole, if you go after skills and you have glass now and you have, I don't know, May and McClanahan and all these guys, your stats are going to look great. And then you're going to go into the playoffs with two starters. Yeah. That's a crap. And Jalen beats, right? Because, because you don't have the guys that got you there. And I think you can you can see that over time with a lot of these teams that win. It's the teams that have the 200 inning horses that, you know, year after year after year, they post. And you I, know what? I'll, I'm going to take that and transition on onto mine because I got a different take on that. Sure. My uh, um, my starter for overrated is uh, is Spencer Strider, um, not because I don't like him. I think that uh, he looks great. He's got great legs. You know, my uh, uh, I don't know if it's the tightness of the pants or he's working out. But uh, anyway, he looks great. But he's uh, his ADP is at eight on that. And so my point is with pitchers isn't the 200 inning starter on that is that uh, with pitchers that you're allowed with with uh, first baseman, you're allowed to have one first baseman maybe two with the utility role on that. You know, you're allowed to have one second baseman, you're out, or allowed to have one, you know, so on and so forth. With starting pitching, you can have four, you could have six, you could have nine if you wanted to. So you don't necessarily need the 200 inning horse yep. in starting pitching, but you just need to have volume. And I think that the way to have good, consistent quality volume is not getting your first round pick as a starting pitcher you need to hit those mid- middle, that mid-range ADP of, you know, 150 to 250, and you just need to bulk up and have all those pitchers on your roster because you get to decide how many pitchers you want, and they don't necessarily need to be workhorses, but if you have enough of them, then you're going to win in our league in particular. So anyway, I just wanted to interject on that, that you need to you need to uh, bulk up on the starters and and spend less time maybe looking at uh, at the at the two hundred innings only. What happens if you go against a team that has five starters with two hundred innings though? Well, depending on when they start that week, because we got a weekly head to head, 
if they're starting on Wednesday and Thursday, then you've got a great chance of destroying that guy. If their starters are starting on Monday and Tuesday, then you've got a problem. Right. I'm thinking more like playoffs, two week types of playoffs, right? Where you're going against the team who's rolling out eight, nine starters and they're all still quality because three of them didn't get hurt. Right. And they don't have to replace them with three bottom feeders. They still have their horses going. And that's to me, that's the big thing. The other thing is you can get overwhelmed by strikeouts in 2.2 seconds in our league. If you don't have the types of guys that go six, seven innings in a game and can put up nine strikeouts, right? You go against the right team who can do that and you've already lost that category. So yeah. I think it's, it's innings. Yes but it's also innings with the ability to maintain ERA and whip and strike people out. Those, those are the teams that scare me shitless. It's the ones who you look at their starting staff and you just say to yourself, I don't know if I can overcome that starting staff, right? My offense better be perfect because I'm not winning, you know, off the bat, I'm not winning five categories because their yeah. starting staff is so good. Uh, Matt, did you finish? Um, no, I didn't. Why don't you go um, ahead and finish? And and this is this is the first time I've used the underrated of my own player. So um, so I just want to. You didn't have to say that. You didn't have to say that. By the way, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um. So both my underrated and favorites is the same. This is somebody I've actually acquired twice from um, from Catillo Pitt each year um, before keeper period. This is Edward Cabrera. Um, Edward Cabrera is like, a, to use a golf analogy, the guy that could just clobber the ball 300 yards on the drive yeah. and then like miss a three foot putt, right? Mm -hmm. um, the type of guy that, that I would kind of bet on that maybe he turns it around. He's that typical pitcher that has everything, but then just loses it with walks. Um, my theory in watching him a lot last year is a lot of his head case. I don't see it in his mechanics. He 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 can get off sometimes when it when it comes to to um to overthrowing, especially when it comes to um to trying on a three two count to to throw that change up, um, which which is elite, but sometimes it's hard to get over. Um, his fastball can be hit on those three two counts as well. His fastball got hit a little more last year. But if, his, if he could recover what his fastball was in 22, along with how he improved his off-speed, he even brought in the curveball um, last year where his opponents, when they did make contact, were, were slugging well under 400 on everything. Um, I think he has one of the – he has the – he's in top 10 when it comes to stuff in the league. Mm -hmm. Um when it comes to control, he's not. But I'm willing to bet on that as as a fourth or fifth starter. I think he has the highest ceiling at at um, the average draft position, which is 281 in a dynasty league. Mm -hmm. The other anticipation there too is I hope he gets traded. Um, Baltimore and New York are looking carefully at him. I hope your guy, um, Jesus, I um, Lazardo. I hope um, Miami keeps um, saying no and those teams um, go after Cabrera. I think a change of atmosphere would be great for his head. And uh, and yeah, so I so I would I'm cheering for him. He's just fun to watch. Um, he's a big guy on the mound. I think he can um, give a lot of innings. Um, he does. He does have an injury his, history but he does have the size and the and the physique to overcome that so that is both my oh, oh let's see underrated and favorite that's my that's my uh my prediction is that he's gonna he's gonna be pitching for the uh for the orioles uh by opening day for sure i, I see it happen i love me some edward cabrera you know that and i i think your your analysis is spot on um 95 mile an hour change up is disgusting by the way uh all right overrated is the pitcher that i just traded for from doug uh blake snell um you know i'm betting that the blake snell of 2024 is the blake snell of last year where you can count on 200 strikeouts um winning the nl cy young and winning the al cy young uh in 18 is like you know, those are huge accomplishments. 
but those were the only two years that he broke 180 innings. And every other season, he hasn't gotten over 130, right? So let's just start with the health. And then the other thing is he walks batters on purpose, right? Yeah. He yeah. People talk about his control, but it's not a lack of control. It's an unwillingness to give in at any cost. And I think that it's while it's an interesting approach, and I think it serves his ERA very well, it does not serve his whip very well at all. No. And, and so you've seen him even last season as the Cy Young Award winner with the 119 whip. And then if you start in 19 after his Cy Young Award, uh, AL Cy Young Award, 127 whip, 120, 132, 120, and last year 119. And while that's not, um, that doesn't mean that he wasn't an incredibly effective pitcher. I think for our purposes in fantasy, when you couple the lack of innings or the lack of seasons with big innings and his propensity to walk hitters, it's scary, right? And if he was my ace, I wouldn't feel good, but he's my number four. And so that feels a little bit different to have him as my number four. I love the strikeouts, obviously, who doesn't, right? 234 strikeouts last year and a 225 ERA, but he is scary. And I think he is overrated in large part because of the NL Cy Young um, and the AL Cy Young in 18. Uh, my underrated is, and I wish Aaron was here for this one, is Logan Webb. Um, the, the background or context on that is that we had this huge debate about basically is Logan Webb a decent pitcher? And I said, yes, he said, no. This dude, man, in 22, he, well, let's start. 21 was his first real year. 148 to third innings. Didn't, you know, struck out more in a batter per inning, but didn't look like a big strikeout pitcher. 3.03 ERA. Sinker baller, people worried, is, can he strike people out? 22. In 2022, 15 and nine with the 192 in the third innings, 2.90 ERA. You're thinking, okay, like two years now, Looks good. Still worry about a pitcher that's so ground ball heavy. Last year, 216 innings, 3.25 ERA. Whips, 21, it was 111. 22, it was 116. Last year, 1 1.07. Like the skills are there. He's given you three years of 148 plus innings, one year of 216 and an ERA that was no higher than 3.25. So basically it's almost 600 innings in the last two years of about a 3.0 ERA, right? And close to, and just under a strikeout per inning. I just, I think he's underrated. And I know he's in fantasy circles, he's valued probably slightly under what he's actually worth. But man, give me Logan Webb 10 out of 10 times. I, I just think he's a phenomenal pitcher. And I think he's incredibly underrated. He's not, we don't bring him up when we're talking about the best pitchers in baseball. And those numbers to me, especially if you value health, those numbers to me say Logan Webb is a top pitcher in baseball. Yep, absolutely. And the reason why he's underrated, terrible face. Absolutely. <laughs> he does have a terrible face. <laughs> so my favorite pitcher is, I'm saying it's George Kirby. I love George Kirby. I think George Kirby is very unique in his, with his command. Um, I think he's unique in that he is able to and willing to tinker with his pitches or just start with a new pitch on the mound randomly, right? You saw his repertoire go from four seamer slider curveball with the occasional changeup to last year, basically scrapping the curveball mixing in a split and throwing a two seamer really often to right-handed hitters up and in. And he even threw a knuckleball when uh, Tim Wakefield died, you know, to honor Tim Wakefield, like, and he's such a cool customer. I just, George Kirby, I love him. I'm so glad he's a Mariner. I could put Castillo in there. I could put Bryce Miller in there. I could put, put Brian Wu in there. I just, I feel really lucky that as a Mariners fan, um, it's like the golden age of pitching for this team. And I remember the years of Mike Moore and Eric Hansen being like my superstars. And so this, I don't take this for granted 
uh, one bit. But George Kirby is, can you imagine if George Kirby was a Yankee or if George, George Kirby was played pitched for the Phillies? Like people are saying like, he's like Aaron Nola. No, he's much better than Aaron Nola. He's, he's a superstar. And to me, he's a potential AI, AL Cy Young award candidate uh, in 2024. But those are my three, Snell, Logan Webb, and George Kirby. Who's the number one Seattle pitcher? Castillo. I think it's Castillo mostly because Castillo is um, is the the veteran, right? He's the considered the ace. But I think from a a uh, results standpoint, I think Castillo and Kirby are one A and one B. I think they're both really really phenomenal um, starters. And I, I would bet at least one of them is below 3.0 ERA this year. We'll see though. I, I can't wait to watch to watch this team, man. I'm I'm like, I can't wait. It's gonna be phenomenal. Uh looks like we lost Smurf. Um there you go. Not sure. Do you do we want to go over the last category? We kind of did um over the over the, the course of this pod, um, maybe quick bullet points. Um, how has your approach changed over the years for our uh, hybrid keeper league? How has it changed over the years? Well, since we um, were inning with pitching, um, we didn't cover relievers. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that continues to evolve for me. Um, I was always somebody who felt like I was – I was completely naked without it having two closers going right. into the year. Um, over the last last five years, I changed my philosophy based upon, you know, we're a saves huh. hold league. Let's just get the, the most skilled relief pitcher here. Um, for me, that's kind of changing back. Um, I think once you get to the playoffs and every category matters, mm -hmm. It hurts you if you have a, a player I liked and I loved it, all's a leg, who isn't necessarily a number one closer, right? And he got hurt at the end of last year. Right. Um, if you have the elites going in, that's going to make you feel very secure about the category, especially under save. So, so for me, I'm 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 moving back towards trying to get those those elites. Um, closers especially ones that have established themselves um and um you know batista helped you last year he's a little young with his arm so you know he he did um have to have um Tommy john surgery but even getting the those those veteran reliable um closers who are a bit older i think are are invaluable um so so that's one thing the other thing too that um I've learned over the years, especially in our hybrid league, is I used to be very addicted to finding the sleepers, right? <laughs> because you're kind of cool if you find the sleepers, right? Yeah. And you could say, hey, look at me. Uh, look, look, I was able to, to discover this guy when really, you know, everybody else is talking about the sleepers. I don't think there's any, any really secrets to sleepers anymore. But the problem with that is even if you have a sleeper, um, you end up overpaying for that sleeper. And then the value in the sleeper is underpaying, right? Right. So um, so I especially when it comes to prospects, sleeper prospects or you know, pop-up prospects, I used to like that, but um I think in in long term they hurt you. So so I've moved more towards the position of looking for elite prospects, elite prospects that um are going to going to be that number you know the top 100 player you know two to three years from now right. and even investing quite early i think our league is caught on um everybody taken from last year's mlb draft um was gone by the end of mid-year i think they'll be even gone sooner this year even though this draft isn't as, as strong as last year's um so so finding those those elites with pedigree is mm -hmm. is so important over spending your time looking for sleepers that that um probably you know they're going to give you like a a Michael Kadire maybe two cool years um but other than that they're not somebody that you're going to build your team on right 
Can I just say to just talking about elite prospects or identifying them early and really kind of investing in them, listening to just baseball talk about Tamar Johnson made me so pumped. And I, not that just baseball is the, is the end all. And I know some of the warts that people see from, you know, Tamar's season last season, because he hit for a ton of power, but the hit tool wasn't what people expected. Um, just, it gets you excited. And I think you're right. Like it's, it's not about the, the fringy top 100 prospect. It's about the, identifying the guy who's going to be a top 10 prospect in a year or two. Right. It's, mm -hmm. And I, I try not to talk about this often, but I rostered Julio Rodriguez before most people knew who he was, right? And part of that was because I wanted him to be great because he was a Mariners prospect. But part of it was also just watching tape and knowing this guy's not going to, he's a can't miss, right? And I think you're right, though. You know, you, you want to be, it's cool to be the guy who discovered the next great prospect. But the reality is that, it's or the sleeper prospect, but it's not gonna. How many times do you hit on that? And how many roster spots and waiver claims do you spend trying to find that guy? Um, if you're done with yours, I've got my list that I'll run down here real quick. Do you have any more? Um, nope, those are the two main ones for me. All right. Um, so first thing that's changed for me is I value starting pitching more than I have. I think. And when I say starting pitching, I mean mostly depth and good depth as opposed to just having guys and health, right? I think when you look at my roster, at least in our home league, that's what it says. You know, I don't have the, I don't have the, maybe core, you can make a case Corbin Burns, but I don't have the sexy guys, right? I think it's just having a lot of starting pitching that's quality at minimum keeps you in those categories till the end of the week. And a lot of pitching staffs just will never get there. Right. Um, so valuing starting pitching is really important to me because I don't think you can win without it. The second one is, is exactly what you said. I have keep fewer prospects, but really value the elite more than I have. So it's not having seven prospects. It's having, you know, three plus two guys who are eligible for the minors, but those three are guys that you truly, truly are invested in. You believe in their skill. You have a succession plan for where they're going to play. And he's the, the guys are just, they're, they're your guys, right? Um, and then not spending the, the requisite waiver claims to churn your minor leaguers because you just have the guys that you spent the time scouting to understand this is who you want. Um, the next thing I have is listen less to experts because I think, you know, previously I would listen to experts and I would listen to tons of pods and I would actually, you know, utilize some of that information in my moves. And the reality is while I'm not putting them down, I think there's, it still is value. You and I specifically have spent enough time investing in scouting and learning and, and understanding what to look for that I'm my own expert. You're your own expert. And so it's important to bring in the opinion of others, but I don't necessarily believe the opinion of others anymore. It's just to challenge my thought. It's to help me think critically about what I've already seen, which is a really different approach than what it used to be. Um, the, the other two I have are value plate appearances more. I spoke to that earlier on this podcast. I just, I think you have to have volume, right? You have to have I keep bringing them up, but Freeman and Simeon on the right side of my infield is a hell of a place to start, right? Because they're going to have, they're going to score a hundred runs. You're, it's probably 200 runs, close to 200 RBIs, 50 home runs and 40 to 50 steals right off the bat. And to me, that's huge. Whereas you could have a guy like a Rowdy Telez who was brought up today as well, no knock against Telez, but he might only get 400 plate appearances meaning you have to roster another guy who plays first base. Um, to me, that's huge. And the last one is that draft picks just don't really matter to me anymore. Um, when you look at the first couple of rounds in our league over the last couple of years, it's 
it's a crapshoot, man. I remember taking Luis Urias like in the first round two years ago, looking at his skills and saying, you know what? I love those skills. I like that dude. He's going to continue doing this. I'm penciling him in. Like, that's my guy. And he was crap. I just think it, you have to remember this is round 16, not round one. Mm-hmm. So, you know, does it is it great if you have a bunch of number ones? It is. But to me, there's more value in number ones and trading them for a better player than there is in actually picking there. Because we can pick up Wyatt Langford before the draft. We're not a, we're not a league that does it, you know, where you can pick where you can only pick them up after a certain time. So mm-hmm. the value the value in ones are, are so much less because of that. Mm-hmm. It's about advanced scouting. It's about looking way down the road and being able to project who's going to be good. Um, mm-hmm. I do think it helps with top end relievers. And I do think it helps with some of the teams like yours or mine or balls deep where the team is deep enough, you know, they have to cut people, but I just, I don't put the same value in it than uh, that others do. And mm-hmm. I'm not comfortable with not having 10 fifth round picks, right? I don't want to pick at the end of the very end of the draft, but I don't need those firsts. The, mm-hmm. the, the value in those firsts are to get a Jackson Churio, mm-hmm. to acquire a Jackson Churio from someone else. It's not to pick, you know, to fill the hole at catcher at pick number seven overall. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's interesting. It is interesting to think about how you looked at things previously. It is interesting to think about how baseball is changing, right? The, the health of pitching still dictates the current, the way pitching health is going currently really does dictate how we build our rosters. Mm-hmm. And so to pay attention purely to skill and not to health is just, I don't know what to say, man. Um, mm-hmm. But that is one of the big changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I like what you said about the value of draft pick 16th round, because really our rounds, if we're keeping 15 players or 16 teams round, the one, one overall pick is 241. Yeah. So, so why wouldn't you let, let, let's say that you have some prospects that that you know you can get later um that you value why not kind of put those aside and use those ones to get a top 100 player because there's people in this league um that have an overflow of players that you could use that one to get a player that's like a a fifth round in a real dynasty a first year dynasty draft it's yep. just it's just nuts how much these ones are worth are are valued in, in a hybrid league. I agree. I, the issue there though, is people are managers are unwilling to admit that their eighth keeper is less valuable than someone else's 16th. And I think that's what it comes down to is, is I think if you were unemotional about it and more calculated about it, you would deal your first, if you were trying to rebuild, you would deal your first, you know, four rounds to the top teams in the league for their first cut. Mm-hmm. And you would just ask them, are you cutting this guy? Are you cutting that guy? Are you cutting this guy? And trade your picks for them because you make your team better that way, right? Instead, you're waiting for the people that are getting cut. And like like a Bryson Stott. Right. I know, you know, there are other circumstances as to why he got cut. But the, the reality is. If you could give someone uh, like a two or a three, you could have given uh, Alvis a two or a three for Stott. And acquired him, you got your starting second. Now, he's probably not a top five starting second baseman, but you've got your starting second baseman for the next however many years. Right. Mm-hmm. For a draft pick. Mm hmm. Or, you know, for me, like an Evan Phillips, barring a Dodgers trade or free agent signing for a closer, I probably won't keep Evan Phillips. And you look at his stats over the last two years, why wouldn't you give up a two or a three for a guy like that? Right. But I'd never get offers like that for any of those guys. I'd ask, are you keeping Teoscar Hernandez? Right. Mm -hmm. Are you keeping Mason Wynn? 
-hmm. Are you keeping, you know, it could go on and on. Lazaro Montes, any of those guys. Like, I'd be giving up picks for those guys because it's rounds 15, 16, 17, 18. But Mm -hmm. I don't know. It seems logical to you and I, but that doesn't mean that everyone else thinks that way. You got anything else? Um, not really. No, no. I'm just looking forward to the season. I'm I'm bummed that this is over because I was looking forward to it all week, and now and now we have to wait for wait for some more baseball news or or stuff like that. I guess we'll have first base this week, um, right? Right. We'll have a a lot of uh, Xavier Isaac talk. <laughs> it should be fun. All right, man. Well, this was the uh, Monos Pod Roundtable. We didn't really talk minor leagues. We talked major leagues and fantasy, but we will be back on Tuesday. I will have it up by Wednesday. This is our top 10 uh, first base minor league players for Dynasty. Um, We'll keep moving through the positions. Uh, I will have a Mariners cast up pretty soon as a reaction to the two trades that they made. Um, It's all fun. It's podcast season. Baseball's on the way. I can't wait, man. Um, Just finished the uh, hitter portion of my database. So throughout this podcast, I was actually querying each position as we went. Um, Super duper fun, but I don't know. Baseball's the best, right? Mm -hmm. By far. Thanks, man. This was fun. I love it. Uh, We, like I said, we will be back soon. Um, Thanks y'all for listening. Take care y'all. Peace.